Uh, thank you. I'm pleased to be convening the sixth meeting of this session between the Conveners Group and the First Minister. I'd like to welcome the First Minister to the meeting today. I'd also like to welcome everyone who's come to watch this session. Uh, this uh, gives conveners the opportunity to question the First Minister about the programme from government from the perspective of the Parliament's committees. We have up to two hours for today's session, and I propose to give each convener around six minutes to ask their questions. That's with the exchange. Given that lots of issues cut across the remits of different committees and we have extra time, other conveners should indicate to me if they would like to ask a supplementary question from their committee's perspective following a particular exchange. I've got about 20 minutes in hand for any supplementaries, plus that's the exchange as well as the supplementary. We need to finish around 1.55pm at the latest as chamber business starts at 2pm. But even if then, if we've got time at the end of all that, if there's further questions, quite happy to put them. And First Minister, do you wish to make some opening remarks? No, I'm happy just to get into questions. Thank, Thank you very you. much. And the first, we've grouped them together. So the first set will be Brexit, Brexit-related issues. And I call Graham Simpson from the um, Parliament's uh, DPLR committee to be followed by Joan McAlpine uh, from the... What's that? Culture to she's got all abbreviated, no idea what it stands for, C-tier, Culture, Tourism, Europe and something else uh, committee. There we are. You're going, you're going to lead me by the nose in these things. Right, Graeme Simpson, please. Here I am. Um, well, afternoon, First Minister. Um, and DPLR uh, stands for Delegated Powers and Law Reform. <laughs> it's in my briefing. <laughs> and... Uh, uh, of course, we deal with uh, every, every piece of legislation that com comes through our committee. We're not a political committee. We don't uh, take political views on any of this. It's uh, merely a technical committee. Um, so we obviously um, have a bit, a bit of a workload. Uh, and I've been looking at that. And I, I should say at the outset, um, thanks has to go to um, your Minister for Parliamentary Business, Graham Day, uh, for the level of communication that he's brought to the job. It's been very, very useful. Um, I think all conveners would probably agree with that. Um, by my reckoning, um, according to some correspondence I've had from Mr Day, um, we've got 12 Scottish Government bills being uh, introduced this year. Uh, seven of those have still to be introduced. And added to that, uh, there are 17 bills which are already on the go. So that's on top of all that. So it's quite a programme. Um, and then you've also got the, the, the bill that you announced recently, which was the Framework Bill. That's not uh, on uh, an independence referendum, so that's not included in those finger, figures. Um, I asked you about that um, in the chamber, and whether it would, whether you thought that it, introducing that would have a knock-on effect to the other pieces of legislation. Um, so I'm asking you that again today, because your response then was basically, you'll, you'll manage. Um, no doubt we will manage, um, but I'm just interested to you know, see if anything's going to give. OK, thank you uh, very much for your question. And firstly, can I uh, begin by recognising the workload on all committees and uh, particularly on the Delegated Powers and Law Reform uh, Committee? Uh, the standard workload has obviously been uh, added to in recent times from the uh, impact of Brexit and the subordinate legislation that has required to uh, be considered there. So I'll put on record my thanks to the committee for all of that. I'm also pleased to hear that the communication uh, between Graham Day and your committee, and I hope all committees, is uh, good and positive. Um, in answer to the question about the Framework Bill, I should say, as I've said in the Chamber, we um, anticipate introducing the Framework Bill uh, next uh, in this month, we're now in May, of course. Um, we do not intend for that to displace uh, or delay any other bills. Uh, obviously, in terms of the timing and the sequencing and uh, the day-to-day -day, uh, management of bills, Graham Day will continue to discuss that with uh, committee conveners as appropriate, but it is not uh, our proposal that any other bill has to slip because of that one. Are you, are you, yeah, thank you. Are, are you absolutely confident that that won't be the case, or is it just a, a wish? I am confident that that is the case, that there is no requirement for any other part of the legislative programme to slip. Um, I often, when I come to uh, 
this session of conveners will hear uh, regularly, uh, often from the Justice Committee in recent years, uh, concerns being expressed about the legislative burden on committees and from time to time uh, different committees will express concerns that that might have an impact on their non-legislative work. We take all of this into account. We have, and I make absolutely no apology for this, we have a very full legislative programme mm -hmm. and all of the pieces of legislation are merited. Uh, we don't bring forward legislation for no reason. And I am confident that of, of what I've told you, as with any legislative programme, uh, you know, changes happen within year for a variety of different circumstances. And the uh, last period, that's largely been about Brexit. And we need to make sure that dialogue continues so that uh, committees and the government have a mutual understanding of each other's needs and priorities and how we collectively manage those. But I'm absolutely confident in uh, what I've just said to you. OK. And your plan is to launch that this month? Uh, the plan, obviously, as members know, the, uh, the pre-introduction uh, sort of arrangements that have to be gone through with any bill um, will always uh, have to be taken into account. But our uh, plan, as I said in the chamber two weeks ago, is for this bill to be introduced. Uh, I think when I said it in the chamber, I said next month. Of course, we're now in next month, so later uh, in this month. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Joan McAlpine, Convener of <coughs> Culture, Tourism, Europe and External Relations. Uh, thank you very much. Um, my committee, uh, First Minister, has recently been taking evidence on the trade agreements that the UK government has either signed or is seeking to sign in order to replicate deals that Scotland already benefits from through membership of the European Union. Uh, these are sometimes called rollover agreements, uh, but my committee is well aware that there's no such legal concept as a rollover agreement and that some of the agreements that the UK government has signed differ considerably in uh, coverage from the agreements that the EU already has with the UK. Uh, so my question is, to what extent has the Scottish government been involved in discussions with the UK government on the content of these proposed agreements prior to the UK government formally signing them? Well, I mean, this is a, a very important question and, and focuses on a particular aspect of Brexit planning. I mean, just in, in terms of the context for this, the UK government is working through a trade agreement continuity programme to, to use the, the phrase you use, to roll over trade agreements currently in place between the EU and different countries that uh, the UK will have to take over. Um, now, uh, if uh, I think the withdrawal agreement had that passed would have uh, seen the EU asking these countries to uh, roll over these agreements. But in the absence of that, the UK is, is having a number of bilateral uh, discussions. My information is that of the 40 or so agreements that fall into this category, I think nine so far have been uh, signed. So this is an ongoing programme of work. Um, to go to the heart of your question, and uh, I'll be as diplomatic as I possibly can be, and as I'm known for my diplomacy, obviously, um, this is one of many aspects of Brexit planning where the involvement of and dialogue with the Scottish Government, with devolved administrations generally, has been woefully inadequate. As, as you rightly say, there has always been an understanding that in the process of trying to replicate these agreements, there may be changes to the scope of them or to the detailed content of them. And those changes may very well impact on areas of devolved responsibility. Uh, my expectation, uh, both for these agreements and for new trade agreements, if uh, that's where we go in the future, would be that the Scottish Government and probably more importantly the Scottish Parliament would have a very formal role in scrutinising um, and commenting on and influencing the detail of these and that is you know something that's not unusual in other countries where there are devolved or federal arrangements. In the experience so far around this that has not been uh, the reality. The Scottish Government has not been uh, not had shared with us the, the draft of these agreements. We have not had the opportunity to you know, comment in detail. The involvement has been, by and large, by the way of updates from the UK government. Often these are updates after the event, so they're telling us things that have already happened as opposed to giving us the opportunity to influence what will happen. And it's one of many areas where the experience has been very frustrating. And in terms of the job of the Scottish Government and, if I may say so, the, the job of the Scottish Parliament and its committees to properly scrutinise uh, work that has a big impact on our responsibilities has just not been what we would expect it to be. Thank you. 
Thank you very much for that answer. And yes, that reflects my committee's experience. In fact, my committee only learned about these agreements when they were passed to us by a House of Lords committee uh, who had, uh, had been given them by the UK government. And I believe that the, uh, the House of Lords committee got them before the Scottish government did. So there's clearly there's a, a problem there. But if I can go on to ask, um, the committee's aware that geographical indicators and state aid are areas of disagreement between the Scottish and UK government with regard to the extent with which these policy areas are devolved or reserved. Given the significant importance of these issues to devolved competencies and Scottish interests more widely, um, could you provide us with an update on whether progress has been made? What stated in particular obviously impacts on our, our ability to um, have, have government support um, vital infrastructure projects and, and Scottish companies, for example? Well, firstly, you're right, there are a number of areas, and you cite two of them, state aid and geographical indicators, where there is not uh, uh, an alignment of view between the Scottish Government and the UK Government as to whether these matters are devolved or reserved. And in my view, uh, areas like this uh, are you know, either clearly devolved or have such an impact on devolved uh, responsibilities that they have to, you know, the, the Scottish Government and Parliament has to have a, a significant role in in determining policy. In terms of the progress of these discussions, they are ongoing. Um, we haven't reached uh, final definitive conclusions on all of these matters. Um, there is a frustration that our views in these matters are not being taken uh, as seriously as, as they should be. And I mean, obviously, I, I don't and wouldn't try to speak for the Welsh Government, but I think in general terms, they would uh, voice the same concern as I am right now. Uh, and, I, and this speaks to a wider and deeper concern I have about the future, and I, I voiced this in my statement to Parliament a couple of weeks ago, that over uh, the, the next period, and you know, for the first time in the 20 years of this institution, there is a risk that we see devolution going into reverse. Um, and that's not necessarily a wholesale removal of powers, but an interpretation of the, the Scotland Act and the reserve devolved split that instead of you know, and I wouldn't want to see this has always worked perfectly the way we would have wanted it to in the past, but instead of a, an approach that has almost a sort of presumption that if there is a doubt, then you have a kind of subsidiarity uh, principle at play, then what we will find, and what I think we're already starting to detect, is a view is to interpret things as tightly as possible in order to say they're reserved uh, where there is any doubt. And that uh, will lead to a creeping centralisation. I think trade deals in particular, the, the desire there will be on the part of the UK government to impose uniformity, even in areas that are devolved, will fuel that kind of approach. And I think that's a big concern. It's a big concern for government. I think it should be a massive concern for the Scottish Parliament. Uh, and when you couple that, of course, to what we've already seen, which is a willingness to override the consent of this Parliament, then, you know, lots of alarm bells about the future of devolution, even before we get into debates about greater powers or independence, the future of the current devolved settlement should be something that is concerning uh, members of this Parliament. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Bruce Crawford, Commissioner of Finance and Constitution, be followed by Ruth McGuire. Bruce. Uh, thank you, President Officer. Well, given your open exchange and uh, your response to Joan McAlpine, First Minister, as you know, the current devolution settlement set out in the Scotland Act in 1988 is based on a pretty clear distinction between reserved and non-reserved powers. Therefore, to what extent do you think that the devolution as set out in that Scotland Act actually remains robust enough now, given Brexit, and does there need, do there need to be changes here? First um, Minister. I think there need to be substantial and fundamental changes, and not just, a, again, a, I don't need to look into a crystal ball to answer this. Uh, we can draw on our experience of the last couple of years, where the devolution settlement that has, you know, notwithstanding our differing views on the future of this parliament, uh, the devolution settlement, uh, if you think about the Seoul Convention, for example, has stood the test of time. Suddenly it doesn't, because on you know, the first real substantive occasion where the Scottish Government and the UK Government's views were opposed, the UK Government just disregarded that convention and you know, rode roughshod over the consent provisions for this Parliament. That's one example. We then had the situation where the Withdrawal Act, uh, which was passed despite our uh, refusal of consent, contained within it provisions that reduced the competence of the, the Parliament, and obviously a lot of that was played out in the Supreme Court uh, decision on the con our continuity bill. 
And then we've had, uh, you know, instances around the financial arrangements that have, uh, with the uh, changes that have come about as a result of the fiscal framework, but nevertheless, you know, financial arrangements that have been accepted with the payment to the DUP for the coalition, uh, all of that just suddenly not really counting for anything. So that's the experience. And as I've just said to, to Joe McAlpine, I do think all of that should make us very, very wary about the future. If these conventions, the Seoul Convention, for example, it doesn't mean anything if you've got a UK government that only respects it when it suits them to respect it. Um, the same is true of the financial arrangements that govern the, the budgetary situation. So I think there is a need for a really fundamental look at all of this. And I, again, I, I would stress, I'm not talking here about the wider debates about greater powers or independence for this parliament. I'm talking about how the current settlement works. Uh, and that, in my view, uh, before we get into these wider debates, is absolutely right for reform. Bruce Crawford. Uh, a Brexit-related issue still, uh, Deputy President of uh, First Minister, at committee this morning, we heard from Derek Mackay, the, the Cabinet Secretary for Finance, that he was minded to consider asking for the assignment of VAT to be delayed. This due in summary to the complexity and volatility of the uh, assigning VAT based on estimates and not on real outturn data. He told us there was a very real risk to the Scottish budget as a result of the complexity and volatility potentially amounting to many millions of pounds. And here's the Brexit-related issue. In any situation of Brexit, he said he was there for considering whether the prospect of full devolution of VAT uh, rather than assignment of VAT might be a better option for the, going forward. And I just wonder, given that uh, the, obviously these things that can be, uh, can be a bit limited, whether the First Minister might want to say a bit more about the Scottish Government's position on that. Uh, First I'm happy, Minister. I'm happy to. I, I know uh, the Finance Secretary has been discussing this with the committee this morning and very deliberately we are I mean, the Scottish Government is thinking very hard and very carefully about this at the moment and the views of the committee will be very helpful to us in reaching uh, a final conclusion. Um, we want as many powers as possible to lie with this Parliament. On VAT in particular, the, the current proposal of course doesn't devolve any power over VAT to the Scottish Parliament. Uh, the decisions around the, the rates and the levels of VAT will remain reserved. This is simply about assigning a proportion of the revenues from VAT to the Scottish Government budget with consequent uh, reductions in uh, the block grant funding. The concern here comes from the methodology that's been proposed for that. There, there is never intended to be any real outturn data that will uh, guide the, the decision. It's based on estimates and you know, while that in at normal times would have give rise to concerns anyway, in a time where there is such uh, instability at the moment, largely because of Brexit, then proceeding on that basis could, and it is the Scottish Government's judgment, could absolutely uh, result in a significant hit to the Scottish budget, which is why we have been so open with the committee uh, about that risk and what the options then are. Uh, I would stress the point there is no power here uh, for the Scottish Government, so it's not about not taking on a power or postponing a power. It's about a, a way of calculating the Scottish budget that has enormous risk attached to it, and is it sensible to allow that to be done on the proposed methodology at a time when there is so much volatility in uh, some of the factors that drive this. Um, in terms of, obviously, I don't, I don't want Brexit to happen, but... Um, some of the opposition to full devolution of power over VAT uh, came from uh, European Union uh, rules around this. If the UK is leaving the European Union, I do think that opens up the discussion as to whether, instead of a, a VAT assignment, we should actually have proper devolution of VAT. And that's part of the discussion, of course, that we may want to have in, in the period ahead. So we've been very open and frank uh, with the, the committee and uh, with wider parliament as a result about our fundamental and quite profound concerns here about the implications for the Scottish budget, but we'll be uh, listening carefully to the views of the committee as we try to decide what the best way forward is. Thank you. Uh, Ruth McGuire, Convener of Equality and Human Rights, to be followed by Bill Kidd. Thank you. First Minister, the Continuity Bill would have retained the Charter of Fundamental Rights post-Brexit. With that no longer possible as a consequence of the Supreme Court ruling, 
Can you tell us what um, you're doing to ensure human rights protections in Scotland aren't just maintained, but they continue to keep pace with the European Union? Well, we are uh, absolutely determined that we will uh, do everything within our power to ensure no erosion of human rights protections as a result of Brexit. The um, task force that we asked, uh, the advisory group that we asked to look at these uh, issues for us, uh, recommended three principles which we absolutely uh, adhere to and, and sign up to. First is no regression. Uh, secondly, we should try to keep pace with new uh, European uh, developments. And thirdly, Scotland should always seek to be a leader in human rights uh, in terms of the decisions we take. Um, so those are the principles that will guide what we do. Uh, the fact that the EU Charter of Fundamental Rights is not going to be part of domestic law, as things stand at the moment, I think is a, a matter of real concern. Um, these are uh, rights that you know, have an impact on each and every one of us. Um, and it is a concrete example of a power that we would have had to enshrine that that has been taken away from this parliament without our consent. And I think that should add to the concern we have about it. Um, obviously, in light of the Supreme Court decision, Mike Russell has had discussions with all parties about the, the future of the continuity bill. And uh, obviously, that's been uh, made clear. But we will now ask the new National Human Rights uh, Task Force, which I announced in December was going to be established, to consider how we now best enshrine the principles and values of the EU Charter in Scots law. And uh, that will help us to ensure that the importance of the Charter is addressed uh, in the new human rights framework that the advisory group has recommended. So we still remain very committed to having that one way or another uh, reflected in Scots law. Thank you. Um, could you provide a little bit more clarification on, on the task force, on the establishment of it, the structure of it, um, its membership, and any other information you could share with us? Work is underway uh, just now to uh, establish the task force, which was one of the key recommendations that the advisory group made. Uh, we are uh, currently coming to uh, final decisions on structure and membership and we'll be making announcements on that in the near future, the fairly near future I would hope, uh, and we'll keep Parliament uh, fully up to date uh, with developments on that uh, as they take place. One of the things we're very conscious of is that there uh, are a number of recommendations that have been made by your committee uh, that are very similar to or overlap with the recommendations of the advisory group, uh, for example how we monitor our performance against international treaties, for example. So I think it will be really important that there is very good dialogue and engagement between the committee and the task force in the fullness of time. So it's important that we uh, make sure we think through all of these issues properly at this stage. And finally, First Minister, staying with um, <coughs> human rights, I'd welcome your views on how um, human rights can be more clearly articulated throughout the budget process. Um, it's my view that um, ensuring human rights is embedded at the policy formulation stage is the thing that's, that's actually important in terms of giving people positive outcomes in their lives. Can you provide an update on the, the work being undertaken in this area and how you see um, human rights interacting with equalities? First um, Minister. <laughs> in the budget and the associated tools, First Minister. Well, I think the most important starting point for these discussions, because I, I'm personally very committed to seeing equalities and, and a human rights approach embedded firmly in our policy making and also in our budgetary decisions. If we don't embed it in our budgetary decisions, then we don't uh, achieve what we want to. And the outcomes based approach of the Scottish Government, which is encapsulated in the national performance framework, is key to this. And that also underpins the budget process. Um, the Equality Budget Advisory Group obviously plays a key role in this and it's been involved in shaping the budget process now over a number of years and is currently developing mechanisms to integrate human rights analysis alongside equality considerations. And um, the Scottish Human Rights Commission is represented on that advisory group and I know there was a, a recent meeting between uh, the, your committee, the advisory group and the commission uh, to explore some of the practical challenges that now need to be addressed. I think there is a broad agreement around this. I think the challenge now is to make sure that the practical arrangements support that broad agreement and lead to the outcomes we want to see. And obviously the work of your committee is crucial to getting it right. Thank you. Uh, Bill Kidd, Convener of Standards, Procedures and Public Appointments, to be followed by Lewis MacDonald. Mr Kidd. Is it turned on? Yes. Yeah. I certainly hope so. Are you turned on? 
just turned it off. <laughs> just turned it off, yes. So much for procedures. <laughs> So there we go. Anyway, the SPPA committee will consider the electoral franchise bill when it's introduced. And the programme for government states that the bill will include provisions to extend the franchise for Scottish Parliament and local government elections. Um, and may, maybe uh, this is mostly to do with protecting the franchise for EU citizens. Um, are you able to elaborate on who you will extend the franchise to and how this will be done? Well, in, well firstly, we are as I, I hope has been very clear, determined to protect the position of EU citizens and protect the franchise of EU citizens in Scotland just now. Um, in terms of, to, to try to put in simple terms what the electoral franchise bill will do in this regard, right now it's only British uh, qualifying Commonwealth, Irish and EU citizens resident in Scotland that can vote in Scottish Parliament and local government elections. Um, what we uh, are proposing in the franchise bill uh, for devolved elections, which is all we have the power to legislate for, is that the franchise should be open to everyone who is legally resident in Scotland, regardless of what country uh, they come from. So that will certainly um, help to protect the franchise and the right to vote for EU citizens, but will broaden that to uh, some extent as well. It will mean that citizens uh, of all countries, uh, if they are legally resident in Scotland, will be able to vote in Scottish Parliament and local government elections, um, and they will be able to register to vote in the usual way. Okay. Thank, you. Thank you very much, um, and thanks very much for that, um, First Minister. I, when... Um, well, we don't know what's going to happen, obviously, with the Brexit situation as it stands, because um, it seems to change day to day. Um, but will we look to ensure uh, comfort for those um, citizens who live here in Scotland who originate from EU countries? Will we be able to provide more comfort for them, um, do you hope, uh, once Brexit has been completed, um, in order that we can ensure that the a, that the franchise is as is, is, is wide and, and legitimate as possible? Well, I think we can give that comfort uh, now in terms of devolved elections, um, which is what we are seeking to do through the franchise bill. It's not the only thing we're, we're doing through the franchise bill, but it is a part of that. Um, in terms of elections that remain the responsibility of the UK government, then we are not in direct control of that, but I would certainly hope that they would uh, take similar action. Um, more generally, I still think the way in which EU citizens are being treated is appalling. Um, we were one of, the Scottish Government was one of many different uh, groups that argued for the fee for uh, settled status to be dropped, and I'm glad that was, but for EU citizens, many of whom have you know, seen Scotland, the UK as their home for many, many years, to be forced to go through any kind of bureaucratic process, I think, is a really retrograde step. Um, and all of that, of course, is compounded uh, by the fact that not, not just do I think it is a good thing in principle, I do think it's a good thing that we attract people from other countries to come and live here, as well as encourage uh, Scottish people, particularly young people, to experience Europe and the world. Uh, Scotland has a really... Uh, you know, driving imperative to continue to attract people people to come here uh, because of our own demographics and the recent population statistics that were published just uh, in what, last week or the week before underline that. So I think this is a matter of regret for principled reasons, but also for practical reasons as well. I think that gives a lot of comfort. Thank you very much. First Minister. Uh, I think the next two questions are budget related from the conveners. It's Lewis MacDonald, the Convener of Health and Sport, to be followed by Margaret Mitchell. Mr MacDonald. Thank you very much. First Minister, the Government published the medium term health and social care financial framework uh, a few months ago, setting out uh, the, the financial picture across Scotland and indicating, looking towards 2024, that there would be a, a, a need to shift or save uh, uh, 1.7 billion over, over that period within the, within the budget. Now, the Health and Sport Committee in its pre-budget report for the current year uh, raised the question of how that would apply at health board level and, and the government's response was that work was being done with health boards to look at medium and longer term financial uh, uh, planning for uh, both individual boards and on a regional level. I wonder if you can tell us uh, what progress has been made with that work and whether those regional and, and local uh, medium-term financial plans will be made public? Well, firstly, um, I should 
say, as I think you know and everybody knows, that the, the medium-term uh, financial plan for the NHS is in the context of rising health budgets. We uh, made a commitment to increase the health budget by £2 billion over uh, the lifetime of this parliament, and we've seen uh, increases year-on-year. Year. Health spending now is at record levels, and, and that is right, which none of which is to say life is easy for those managing budgets in the health service. It is not. Uh, the savings targets are about uh, greater efficiency in our health service. They are also about uh, spending money better. You know, the integration of health and social care, as an example, is about delivering better care, but it's also about using uh, health resources uh, better. The work is ongoing uh, with uh, health boards. Obviously, Jean Freeman has uh, announced uh, the change to how we uh, deal with uh, health boards uh, in terms of annual budgeting, the three-year budget planning, the, the, the variance that they uh, are allowed to carry forward, which gives health boards a lot more flexibility. In terms of your question about uh, being made public, we have given a commitment to be transparent around all of this. I know your committee is now given uh, much more regular uh, if not quite real-time, then more real-time information about the uh, spend of health boards against uh, budgeted estimates. So we will be uh, very uh, happy and keen to share that information uh, with the Health Committee and with Parliament more widely. Thank you very much. The brokerage system, in other words, government loans to health boards which are unable to balance their books year by year, uh, the latest figure, I think, suggests £70 million brokerage for the financial year 2018-19. That was from the end of February. I wonder if it's possible yet to say what the final tally of brokerage for, for the last financial year will be, and also uh, whether the government's confident that those boards which have received brokerage in that year will be able to balance their books over the three years as, as is now required. Um, I don't think I've got the figure for... I will check whether that figure is yet available. If it is, I'll, I'll make sure you get it. It may be that it's not yet available just in terms of the, the end-of-year uh, processes around that. We do know in uh, 2018 19 four NHS boards uh, required uh, brokerage. Uh, NHS Ayrshire and Allen, Arran, Borders, uh, Highland and uh, Tayside. Um, in terms of, we would expect uh, health boards to manage uh, their budget within uh, that three-year uh, cycle and utilise the financial flexibility of a 1% under or overspend, uh, provided that they deliver overall uh, break-even uh, by 2022. Um, I think a couple of boards have already indicated plans to use uh, this flexibility in the current financial year 1920. Um, obviously, we will continue to work closely with health boards uh, on an ongoing basis about their financial planning and their performance against financial planning. I, um, you know, in some ways, brokerage is, is seen as um, as a negative, and I, I can understand why that is the case. I mean, we had brokerage for certain health boards when I was health secretary. I actually see it in some respects as, as a positive in the, the relationship we have in Scotland between health boards and governments where we, we seek to manage uh, and, and to help health boards manage their finances so that there is no impact on patient care. And I think uh, while the new arrangements put that on a slightly different footing, I think that close uh, dialogue and relationship will continue to be important. Thank you very much. On integration authorities, I think we still await the final budget uh, plans for each of our integration authorities for the coming financial year. And again, First Minister, I wonder if you're able to indicate uh, when, whether that's now been complete and whether that information can now be made public. Uh, that information will be made public as soon as uh, it can be. Obviously, with integration, uh, we are uh, step up, continuing to step up uh, efforts to ensure that the, the aims of integration, which I think everybody supports are properly translated into the, the positive changes that communities and patients need to see. The Ministerial Strategic Group for Health and Community Care has been uh, instrumental in helping to guide that process and they published their final report in February. Um, and integration authorities, of course, you know, collectively now they're responsible for uh, managing almost £9 billion. So this is an increasingly important part of the overall budgeting in our health service. So transparency and understanding of your committee and parliament generally around that is as important as for the, the whole health budget. Uh, thank you. Margaret Mitchell, Convener of Justice, will by Claire Adamson. Ms. Mitchell. Uh, First Minister, the Justice Committee's Stage 1 reports on the Domestic Abuse Scotland Bill and the Management of Offenders Bill unanimously agreed there was a need for these bills to be implemented effectively 
and um, with appropriate resources. The former Cabinet Secretary for Justice then agreed to look at the financial support necessary to ensure the domestic abuse, coercive and controlling behaviour legislation is effectively resourced and implemented. And the current Cabinet Secretary acknowledged the rollout of HDC and the management of offenders bill would not work without the necessary resources. Despite this, the Scottish Government's 2019-20 budget agreed a real terms cut in the budget for criminal justice social work, made a real terms cut in the funding for electronic monitoring and cut the budget for intensive support packages by 50%. Does the First Minister accept her Government's decision not to back policies with necessary resources not only undermines the policy objectives of these important bills, but more worryingly still, seriously undermines the Parliament's scrutiny process itself. Um, I don't accept that. These are, are always ongoing discussions with committees and also with uh, the different agencies that will be involved in uh, relation to any particular bill. I mean, if you take the domestic abuse bill, for example, a, a flagship piece of legislation that I think everybody across the parliament is proud of, uh, resources were made available in terms of the awareness and the training around that. I, with Hamza Yousaf, uh, visited uh, a women's aid in the east end of Glasgow uh, just before that took uh, effect to see for myself the work that uh, Scottish women's aid were, were leading there around that. So it is important. I mean, we uh, want to see all bills implemented effectively and it's important I mean every bill it comes with a financial memorandum there is a lot of scrutiny that committees put into financial memorandums and we keep as we go through our budgetary process year in and year out we keep these things under review in terms of management of offenders I, I think uh, in terms of uh, some of the performance around uh, that I think there is a lot to suggest that uh, we are making strides in the right direction in terms of uh, prevention and trying to uh, use community uh, sentences, try to keep people, offenders, out of prison where that is appropriate unless they, they need to be in prison. And there is a, you know, as we see a, a prison population that remains very high, there is a, a need to continue to do that to make sure we are spending resource there. So we will look to make these decisions. Uh, you know, I don't need to uh, tell anybody around this table that budgetary decisions year on year are incredibly difficult and we work very hard to protect uh, the budgets that Parliament collectively thinks is important. The reason we've taken some of the tax decisions we've taken, which I know have been not supported by everybody across the Parliament, have been to protect the budgets that are important and that's what we'll continue to do. Yes, certainly awareness training is one thing, but it's fundamental to the implementation of both these bills that criminal justice social work is adequately resourced. Um, perhaps if I could turn to the lack of capital funding available to the police, which means ageing policing vehicle, vehicles are not being replaced and the state is not being properly maintained. This has been well documented with some press coverage ridiculing the situation. What does the First Minister intend to do to rectify this situation and ensure the police have the necessary resources they require and deserve to have to enforce the law and protect the public? Well, in the, the budget for this financial year, the Scottish Police Authority capital budget was increased by 52%. Um, so that's the first thing we are doing, is increasing the budget that the police have available to them. Uh, that increases to support further improvements to police ICT, uh, including improved mobile uh, technology. Since 2015, uh, Police Scotland have invested over 21 million of capital investment in its estate uh, and 28 million of revenue spend on plan maintenance and repair. Uh, Police Scotland are very clear their fleet maintenance team uh, does a very good job. Over 96% of their fleet is uh, on the road. Uh, and we will continue to work closely with the Scottish Police Authority and with Police Scotland to look at their future capital uh, requirements. But I think uh, there's not many budgets I would uh, uh, hazard a guess uh, without every budget line in front of me right now that went up by 52% uh, in this year. And I think that is a recognition uh, of the need to ensure that we are investing in uh, the, the capital requirements of the police, as well as uh, protecting the revenue budget, which we've made a commitment to do uh, for the entirety of this parliament, which of course will deliver a, a hundred million pounds uh, extra in revenue funding for the police uh, over the period to 2021. And I don't, you know, these are not political sessions. I'm not trying to get political here, but you know, there 
was a call made uh, by, by your uh, own party for us to not uh, take certain tax decisions, which would have removed, uh, I think, uh, £600 million or so from the Scottish budget. So these are difficult decisions. And I think what I've said to you uh, just now shows that we are putting money uh, where we consider the priorities lie. Unfortunately, Prime Minister, the, the response you've just given seems to suggest what crisis. SPF, on a daily basis, is saying they do not have the resources, the police vehicles aren't up to scratch, and they're having to close some estate. Will she reconsider her uh, response to me? Um, I think what I've just said is we have substantially increased the capital budget of the police, and we will continue to discuss with the police their capital requirements. You know, I, we, we have a budget that is not infinite. We have to make budgetary decisions. We have to make very, very difficult budgetary decisions uh, because of the overall climate and the pressures on our budget that, you know, we, we know where uh, they emanate from. Uh, so we make those decisions and we stand by those decisions and we, you know, discuss with the police service, we discuss with the health service, we you know, discuss with local authorities where the, the balance of those decisions uh, lie. With the police in particular, um, if the UK government was to actually uh, refund the £125 million uh, paid uh, by the police in VAT between 2013 and 2018, which they haven't agreed to refund, then you know, we'd have uh, more, they would have uh, more money at their disposal. So maybe that is something you can join us in asking them to do. Only if the money is allocated to them, First Minister. Well, I'll make a deal with you just now. I will agree to give all of the money to the police if you uh, persuade the Tory government in Westminster to give us the money. Change. I've got to move on. I am I'm supposed to be chairing this. Um, sometimes I am, sometimes I'm not. Anyway, I now can we uh, call convener uh, Claire Adamson of Education and Skills to be followed by Bob Doris. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. First Minister, um, the government has made its commitment to the United Nations Convention on the Rights of the child um, very vociferously and um, has said that they want that to be embedded into um, civic life and legislation in Scotland. One of the areas of concern for the Education and Skills Committee has been the experience of young people with additional support needs in our schools and we have taken sometimes quite harrowing, sometimes disturbing evidence for um, those families which um, uh, the, the system at the moment seems to have um, failed or been problematic in some way. So I'd like to ask you, what, what difference will that rights-based approach to education make for these young people? Well, I think having the incorporation of the UN Convention, we'll publish a consultation on exactly how we go about incorporation shortly. Our uh, uh, plan is for that legislation to be passed within this session. Of Parliament. I think there is a very broad-based support for that. It is very complex uh, because it, it ranges across uh, almost all areas of responsibility. There are complexities around the devolved and reserved split of the responsibilities, so I, I'm not underestimating the complexity of this, but it is important. In terms of the impact of this, um, one of the things that I think is really important is that we see this as a, a way of making change where positive change where it's required. It, it will have failed, and anything like this fails if it, all it does is result in you know, court cases you know, taking failure to, uh, into the, the, the court process. So it is an opportunity, uh, a real catalyst opportunity, to drive change across uh, the whole area of our responsibilities. In terms of additional support for learning, um, I think our rights with any uh, group in society that are more vulnerable than the population generally, a rights-based approach is particularly important. As you know, uh, given your, your committee's work, uh, we've already been carrying out substantial work around additional support for learning. In March, we published the package of support for schools uh, and local authorities to uh, support continued implementation of ESL, you know, new guidance. There was research also published gathering the views of uh, children and parents about uh, their own experiences and that's been complemented by an Education Scotland uh, training resource. So all of that work is important and uh, the Education Secretary is also uh, committed to a review of the implementation of additional support for learning, including where children learn, because we want children to learn uh, where it most uh, suits their own needs and circumstances.
Thank you um, for that. I absolutely agree with you, First Minister, that the last thing we want to see is a series of court cases. However, we did take some um, evidence. Um, Professor Sheila Riddle from the University of Edinburgh stated that 35% in some local authorities in Scotland are being identified as having the statutory coordinated support plan, which is less than 0.3% of the total school population. And in less, and a quote from her, unless parents and children have a statutory support plan, they have no means of challenging local authority provision or of making use of tribunal in many cases. And at the same session, May Dunsmuir of the First Year Tribunal said that some of the most successful cases at tribunal had been taken with um, the advocacy support provided by the Scottish Government. Um, so obviously, while, while we want an improving situation, um, how, how do you see um, the education of parents and carers and young people and the use of advocacy moving forward to ensure that um, people are aware of their rights and how to exercise their rights? I am I, I, a huge, and uh, this is based on uh, my experience, as you know, we'll all have experiences in my constituency caseload as well as my experience as, as Health Secretary, I am a huge uh, and very committed supporter of advocacy and the power of advocacy for those who uh, often can't make their voice uh, heard without that. And I certainly would not uh, sit here and say that you know, we, we get that right in all areas of policy where that's appropriate. And I think we need to continue to, to look at how we better support advocacy. And I think what you've described uh, there in terms of some of the evidence uh, that came to your committee underlines the importance of having a rights-based approach. You don't want uh, people to have to rely on enforcing those rights, but often it's having that kind of approach in place that then drives the improvements. And you know, having the ability to enforce rights is always a, a safety net people should have. One of the, just very briefly, uh, final comment is, what I don't want to give any impression of is that we think the incorporation of the UN uh, Convention on the Rights of the Child suddenly is this uh, sort of magic solution and everybody doesn't have to do anything. These are ongoing processes of work that we have to continue to prioritise uh, along the way while we're doing the, the work around incorporation. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Bob Doris, Convener of Social Security, followed by Gordon Lindhurst. Mr Doris. Thank you, Convener. Uh, First Minister, the Scottish Government will take on executive competence for all benefits being devolved uh, to this place on the 1st of April 2020. I would like to specifically ask about disability assistance. Cabinet Secretary Shirley Ann Somerville has pledged that no one will be subject to a DWP face-to-face -face reassessment for disability benefits from early 2021, when the Scottish Government launches new claims for our PIP or PIP replacement. That requires the DWP to identify Scottish PIP claimants approaching a PIP reassessment to securely and timidly transfer them to a new Social Security Scotland system. First Minister, how confident are you that we are on track to achieve this and that any face-to-face -face assessment will be a Scottish disability assistance assessment as opposed to a UK PIP reassessment? Well, let me just firstly reiterate uh, the commitment that uh, Shelley Ann Somerville has already given. It is our intention that from that period in 2021 when we take uh, responsibility for, for new claimants, that no individual uh, who's already on the benefit coming up for a review or reassessment uh, will uh, have to undergo uh, the, the assessment under the, the current arrangements. Obviously, as with all aspects of the devolution of welfare benefits, we're having to work very closely with DWP. We are, in many aspects of this, dependent on the DWP doing certain things, and that's been the case throughout. Um, we're not taking a, a system on a wholesale basis and devolving it to Scotland. We're unpicking lots of uh, the DWP's existing systems, and that does make it more complicated. Uh, I think generally, although there will be frustrations and disagreements from time to time, I think we've got a good working relationship and we're determined to ensure that the commitment that's been given uh, will be delivered. OK. Uh, yeah, thank you, First Minister. Now, one of the key aims of the new disability assistance assessments here in Scotland is to ensure that disabled people are not needlessly being called to face-to-face -face assessments where there is clear information available to allow a positive determination to be made without that having to take place. What information can you provide to suggest that this ambition will be realised? And how many Scottish working age disability assistance claimants would you anticipate may no longer be called to needless face-to-face -face reassessments or assessments? Okay, I'm not sure I have the precise figure for you, but I can get uh, that for you. We don't want people to go, uh, have to undergo 
face-to-face -face assessments where they don't need to. Uh, we also don't want people to you know, have to be assessed by private companies. Uh, these uh, assessments will be in-house uh, assessments by uh, the Social uh, Security Agency in Scotland. We are undertaking a, a huge amount of work just now to make sure that we can meet the timetable that we have set and for the, the processes for assessments to be uh, ready in time for delivery. Uh, the Cabinet Secretary will make an announcement uh, later this week, tomorrow. In fact, I think that a contract to support the design of assessments for the new system has been awarded, and that will look at the design of the assessment centre network across Scotland, and look at it, including working closely with users to look at what major improvements uh, on the current system are necessary. Um, and as I say, once uh, the system, Scottish system is up and running, uh, these will be assessments carried out by Social Security Scotland and fully supported by public sector health professionals. Uh, it will give people a lot more choice and flexibility over uh, their assessments, including the times and locations that suit them and the options of home visits uh, for people if they need them as well. So we're, we've made a lot of progress already in identifying improvements uh, so that we have what we describe as a, a people-centred uh, service um, and we want to make sure that that work continues so that we deliver on the commitments that we're making. Okay, and the, the finally, First Minister, the majority of our Social Security Committee called on the UK Government to reverse changes to pension credit that would see mixed-age couples lose out to the tune of around £7,000 a year. The committee also unanimously agreed to urge the UK government to at least delay these changes by six months, given that 40 per cent failed to claim their pension credit in the first place. How can the Scottish government ensure that benefit uptake improves, even if you don't have the powers to reverse these cuts? First Minister. Well, firstly, on the pension credit uh, change, I mean, we are concerned about that as well. We've written to the UK government uh, outlining our opposition to it. We asked actually to see the impact assessment that the DWP had carried out in the policy and were told uh, by the minister uh, responsible that there was no impact assessment. Uh, the DWP had just published some ad hoc statistics. Um, and all of these uh, statistics showed that a lot of people will be potentially affected to the tune of, uh, in some cases, uh, £7,000. So we, you know, this is not a new thing in terms of benefits we are not responsible for. We you know, work uh, hard often with other agencies, Citizens Advice, for example, uh, to encourage people to apply for and take up their entitlement to benefits. And I think that becomes all the more important as changes like this are made. Gordon Lindhurst, uh, Convener of Economy, Jobs and Fair Work, followed by Julian Martin. Mr Lindhurst. Thank you, Convener. Um, First Minister, you'll be aware that in the committee we've been looking at the BIFAB situation. And in the programme for government, it states that the Scottish government will work to ensure that businesses reap the onshore benefits of offshore generation. Um, and in committee, we heard from the unions and BIFAB that no matter how competitive Scottish-based companies are in their bids for offshore renewable work, they will not win contracts if they are being undercut by loss-making state-owned companies in other parts of Europe or the world. Um, so. First Minister, do you agree with that, first of all? And if so, what does the Scottish Government intend to do about this? First Minister. Um, I certainly strongly share the concern that unions have expressed. I, I mean, I sh I've been frank about this in the Chamber uh, in recent times. We're not doing as well as we should be doing, uh, or as well as we want to do in terms of winning the supply chain benefits from these major offshore, uh, or not just offshore, major renewable uh, projects, many of uh, which are offshore. Um, we, as you probably know, convened, Derek Mackay convened a summit uh, just last Thursday uh, involving the unions, the UK government and uh, industry to look at what more we can do. I'm summarising here, and uh, I don't want to oversimplify, but there's two main concerns, um, I think, here. One is the one you have cited where, um, and, you know, companies like DF Barnes, who uh, own Bifab now, will be very, very um, clear on this, that they think there are uh, foreign uh, yards that are uh, making bids at costs that are below value that they could not possibly you know, be profitable in any way, which gives rise to the concern that there is some hidden subsidy there from uh, governments in other countries. We've had discussions with the UK government about how we can get underneath that and try to understand that better so that if there are concerns there that need to be raised with the, the EU Commission, for example, we can do that. So that is ongoing. The second uh, concern is, can we do more? And you know, here there will be questions both for the UK government and for the Scottish government. Um, 
the UK government in their sort of contract for difference work for us in terms of licensing Crown estate uh, arrangements? Can we do more to mandate uh, Scottish or UK content in uh, supply chain? And we're looking at all of these things just now. I know there was a, a fairly positive uh, feedback to those who'd been at the summit last week and we are you know working very hard on both of these elements to try to make sure that we are uh, in an open and competitive way winning as much of this work for Scottish companies like Bifab. Um, on the point of what, what can be done one of the things we heard was about the Bifab yard and methyl which is leased to the company from Scottish Enterprise is the Scottish government willing to put in investment to make that yard a world leading facility to ensure Scotland's port and yard infrastructure is the best that it can be? First Minister. First, I mean, I, I uh, not that long ago met with DF Barnes, I, as I, I have previously, and you know, these were all issues that we discuss on an ongoing uh, basis with uh, the owners of Bifab. The Scottish Government, of course, is a shareholder in uh, Bifab. Not, we don't uh, involve ourselves in the operational decisions of the company, but because of the support we've already given to, to save Bifab from going into administration and then to uh, support uh, the, the buyout uh, by the new company, uh, we have obviously a, a financial interest on behalf of the taxpayer uh, there. So these are, are things we will discuss. I think it's, an, you know, I don't want to uh, put words into anybody else's mouth. If DF Barnes was sitting here, they may say something different. I don't think uh, the, the issues with investment at the yard were the, the key issues of concern in terms of the recent contracts where they haven't uh, been successful, although there are uh, clearly views and the unions have expressed these views as well about the need for investment um, in methyl. So we will continue to look at the Scottish Government's role in that, although, as I say, we have already uh, made uh, available uh, significant financial support uh, so far. Mm -hmm. um, Thank you. If I might just briefly yes. ask about um, one other matter, which I think I asked you about last time we were together with the conveners in this format. Um, I asked you regarding the government's plans for the publicly owned energy company, which the programme for government indicates would be delivered by 2021. And we're now into May, and as I understand it, there's no published business plan, although the policy was announced more than 18 months ago. So there still appears to be little detail as to how this publicly owned energy company will operate or by whom. Um, are you able to tell us if you've seen a draft of the business plan and when it will be made public and perhaps what your own latest thinking on this particular policy is? First Minister. In terms of the work that is ongoing uh, work in this as, as there is on, uh, on most things, uh, we published the independent strategic outline case previously, which I, I think your committee uh, looked at in detail. The work to develop the outline business case uh, is ongoing and not yet complete. Um, I haven't seen the, uh, the, the, the final version of that uh, yet. It will assess the detailed options for the company. Uh, we've already had two engagement events uh, to take input from key stakeholders. In terms of the timing, uh, our plan is that the outline business case will be published in time to support a public consultation on that uh, in, uh, later in this year, later in 2019. But as those uh, timescales get firmed up, I'll make sure that your committee is advised of that. Thank you. I call uh, Gillian Martin, Convener of Environment, Climate Change and Law Reforms, be followed by Jenny Mara. Thank you. Ms. Martin. <clears throat> uh, First Minister, following your recent declaration <clears throat> of a climate emergency, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> an adoption of the Committee on Climate Change's recommended target of net zero emissions by 2045. Can you set out how the Scottish Government intends to deliver a climate change plan within six months of royal assent, as recommended by my committee? First Minister. Well, it was recommended by your committee, and I uh, confirmed in the Chamber last week that we will uh, abide by that recommendation, and it is our plan to... Uh, publish an updated climate change plan within six months of royal assent. In terms of how we will go about that, there's a lot of work involved in that uh, with a lot of uh, resource implications. I've made very clear publicly, I've made very clear within the uh, organisation of the Scottish Government that this is a priority uh, piece of work for us. Um, we will uh, do over the summer some public engagement to help inform uh, the updating of the plan, looking to take views from the public, communities, uh, businesses, industry more generally um, about uh, what in Scotland we need to do to uh, deliver the, the policies that allow us to meet the increased scale of ambition that we set out in response to the Committee on Climate Change last week. Um, 
you know, I said in the chamber at First Minister's questions last week that will involve us looking across the whole range of our responsibilities. We took the difficult decision yesterday on uh, the air discount tax that uh, for all the uh, positive reasons that can be and we have made for that policy in terms of that increased ambition, it is now not... Uh, in alignment with that and there will be difficult decisions uh, not just for the Scottish Government but for all governments and it, I think it's important we do that openly and frankly and governments not just here but elsewhere will only succeed in this if we involve the public uh, very very centrally in that because this involves not just changes of government policy it will involve behaviour change on the part of every individual business and organisation the length and breadth of the country. Gillian Martin. Yeah, as, you, as you said I mean, climate change and tackling it cuts across pretty much all of government portfolios. Uh, what will you do to ensure that each cabinet secretary, minister, government department takes ownership of climate change uh, in the context of their own portfolios? First Minister. We're very firm and I think um, all governments have to take this view that while we've got a cabinet secretary for the environment and climate change, it is not just her responsibility because this does impact across every area of responsibility. Formally within the Scottish Government, uh, that is, uh, you know, that sort of cross-cutting work is brought together in the cabinet subcommittee on climate change, uh, which was established specifically to ensure that we have that cross-cutting approach but regularly you know these are issues that we discuss in cabinet as a whole um, and I think it's fair to say that every cabinet secretary understands the impact often understands the the very difficult impact that that will have for their area of work and while we can always across all of these cross-cutting areas of policy I think we like governments everywhere can get better at the joined up bit of this I think the Scottish government uh, already does very well in understanding that this is a cross-government challenge. Just a cross-portfolio challenge as well. It's also collaboration and cooperation between governments in these islands as well. The UK government, of course, haven't yet made a pronouncement on what their view is of the Committee on Climate Change's uh, targets that they've been set. How does that impact... How, how might their decisions impact on our ability to tackle our ambition. First Minister. Well, the Committee on Climate Change report last week is explicit on this and for anybody with an interest it would uh, be worth reading this because it is very clear that our uh, ability to meet our targets, while a lot of that lies within our own uh, powers and our own responsibilities, uh, we will not be able to do everything we need to do without the UK government also setting uh, or agreeing to the target that is recommended for them, uh, which is a slightly slower move to net zero than recommended for Scotland. So I really, Rosanna Cunningham is, or I think she probably already has now, written to the UK government minister uh, asking uh, for a meeting to discuss this. I hope we see the UK government committing to this target uh, of net zero in their case by 2050 as soon as possible, but also committing to the specific things that the Committee on Climate Change said that they had to do uh, in order to deliver on their target and allow us to deliver on ours. And there were three things uh, uh, that they specifically mentioned first uh, on carbon capture, which the UK government have completely failed to get any momentum behind. They must up their game on carbon capture. Uh, secondly, the Committee on Climate Change said that they had to bring forward their target date uh, for uh, electric and low-carbon vehicles. Uh, their target date right now is 2040, ours is 2032, and they need to be more ambitious around that. And the third area was in the decarbonisation of the gas grid, which you know stands... To, to reason the Scottish Government cannot do on its own unilaterally. So these are the areas where we need to see real uh, UK Government action and a good starting point would be for them to do what we have done and say that they accept the recommendations of the Committee on Climate Change. Thank you. And I call Jenny Mara, Convener of Public Audit and post legislative <coughs> Scrutiny, followed by Edward Mountain. Ms Mara. Good afternoon, First Minister. Um, as you'll know, the Audit Committee's job is to follow the public pound. But the committee has become increasingly concerned over the last year and, uh, or so about the lack of data that's collected by the Scottish Government, so much so that the government's making decisions on expenditure of millions of pounds without basic data that informs those decisions. As you know better than anyone, we need good data to plan, plan where money should be spent, where savings can be made, and crucially, 
to determine if policies are making a difference. I know you'll have been as concerned as I was and our committee was when we took evidence from the Auditor General on children's mental health just a few months ago, because she found that the Scottish Government didn't know the total amount of money that we are spending on children's mental health. The Government doesn't hold data on the reasons for children's referrals to CAMS being rejected, which is an issue of concern to all parliamentarians. And crucially, your government doesn't have any data on how many children get better, on what the outcomes of your policy are. Now, clearly, uh, Dame Denise Coya's work on children's mental health is very important. But the Auditor General's report identified these information gaps at government level. And she also has the same concerns about the lack of data informing your policy on early learning and childcare and on self-directed support. So my question is, this parliament is moving to a new budget process based on outcomes that work's been very ably led by Bruce Crawford. But how can we properly do that job when the Scottish Government doesn't collect basic data that allows you and us to make good policy decisions for our citizens? First Minister. I genuinely think it's a really important area. I don't think it is fair to say the Scottish Government doesn't collect data. We collect acres of data. Um, some people will say we put too many burdens on people in the public sector to collect data that takes away from their ability to do their frontline job. I think what is really important is that we collect the right data, the data that both informs uh, the development of policy and then the performance against policy, and where there are gaps in data, that we take action to fill those gaps. And I think the work of the Audit Committee in this and the work of the Auditor General is important. So if you take mental health, for example, uh, the uh, comments that you've already cited, we've already uh, asked NHS boards to start providing ISD, Information Services Division, uh, who uh, published the the key waiting at times statistics with more detailed information on patients who are waiting or receiving uh, treatment through uh, CAMS services, for example. So we will work actively to make sure that we've got uh, good data, that it is the right data, and that it's, in, it's informing the judgments that require to be made. That's often not something that is you know, set in stone over time. There will be uh, often requirements for us to to change the kind of data sets we're looking at and to make sure that we're, we're keeping that up to date. So I, you know, I would not sit here and say that there is uh, never any gaps in data or areas where we need to gather better data and you know, we will be committed to doing that when we, we need to. Jenny Mara. I think you're on. Thanks for your answer, First Minister. I think you're saying we can always do better on these things. But I think the reports that have come in front of the Audit Committee, the Auditor General has been quite clear that the data is inadequate for the, um, for the policy decisions you're taking and for the amount of money you're spending as a result of those decisions. Let me, on early learning and childcare, the Auditor General set out that the government didn't set out how it would evaluate success of that policy. There was no economic modelling done by the government. There was no information on the expansion in childcare policies, likely economic impact. And the Auditor General herself concluded there is no evidence, none at all, that additional investment has improved the quality of early learning and childcare services. Now, that policy was a significant investment for your government. And in your answer to me, I think you said we can always do better on data. I agree. And you can always tinker and collect better data. But the data that's been collected on children's mental health is different in every health board. It's not shared across health boards. And this isn't anything new. So why hasn't progress been made on this? And I would ask you as well, would you consider a government's data strategy on new policy and outcomes. First Minister. Um, on the last point, I'm happy to consider any proposal like that that comes forward, so I'll, I'll take that away and perhaps your committee or your chair of committee wants to get into a bit of engagement about exactly what you would want to see in, in that kind of, of strategy. In terms of, I mean, I, I think it's important, you, you've mentioned both CAMS and, and early years. And now, I, I don't have the Auditor General's report on early years in front of me, although obviously I read it when it was published. Some of what she said was about what she would have considered data or economic modelling uh, to inform a decision to... Uh, agree a particular policy. We decided as a government, we then had that in a manifesto in an election, that we wanted to significantly increase uh, the state-funded element of childcare. Um, 
for the benefits that we believe that brings uh, to, to young people. I think political parties and governments are entitled to do that. But, Bring, but there's no well, but, hard but you, evidence. But if, in terms of the, the governance of early years, of the implementation of this now, there is a, a very robust governance programme around the, the implementation of that, which Marie Todd uh, talks about uh, regularly. So we are absolutely uh, of the view that we need to have, uh, and it will be different in different policy areas, the, the data and the evidence that allows us to assess uh, policies uh, that uh, we we invest large amounts of money in. In terms of uh, CAMS, you know, we, so when the Auditor General publishes reports, we, we accept the recommendations, we work to you know, put in place what she calls for. Uh, there is a, a situation where health boards were not collecting consistent data on CAMS, which is why we are now working with health boards to make sure that the data that ISD is gathering um, is both consistent and detailed enough for the, the judgments around performance to be made. Um, you know, I, there will often be uh, debates and tensions in this debate, I, as I'm sure you do. I, I speak to frontline professionals in the health service or in other parts of the public sector who will tell me that they, they feel overburdened by the need to collect data. So we've, we've got to get that balance right. And often, as well as closing data gaps and gathering the right data, we need to look at are we gathering data that we don't need that is not particularly helpful because in some respects, and there is, you know, you chair the audit committee, I'm sure you feel like this sometimes as well, the amount of data that comes across my desk on a weekly basis, on a daily basis, um, is enormous. Um, so there is no lack of data out there. I'm not saying that in particular issues in particular policy areas there, there isn't, but generally there's no lack of data that we gather. We need to on an ongoing basis be looking at whether we're gathering the right data, whether there are gaps or inconsistencies in how we do that. And there is a willingness to work with your committee as well as with Audit Scotland in doing that. What I was going to say to you, Jenny, is I'm going to go on, but I've got time at the end for everybody to come back in. You know, there's plenty of time, so you know, just want to give everybody their space at the beginning. Uh, I'm calling Edward Mount, can we in rural economy and connectivity to be followed by James Dornan. I've just found you. Uh, Mr Mountain. Thank you very much and uh, good afternoon, First Minister. You've always been clear um, throughout this Parliament that it's your intention to make sure that all properties across Scotland get superfast broadband by the end of this Parliament. Some of your ministers are rowing back on that, suggesting that it won't be well, in till, well into the next Parliament. Could you just confirm to me that, that it is still the intention to deliver broadband by the end of this Parliament? First Minister. That's the commitment we've made. That's what we are working on. We are in the midst of a procurement process right now, and we hope to conclude, intend to conclude that procurement process later this year. And obviously, the detail of rollout and the timescales attached to that can only you know, be set out with real clarity and definition when we uh, have the, the conclusion of that procurement process. But the commitment that we've made is very clear. Scotland's performance, I should, you know, just as an aside, uh, say that this is, strictly speaking, a reserved uh, matter, but we are invested. So in the First, R100 project... First Minister... Uh, if you just then you'll get well, back in plenty of time, in Mr. The R100 project, you know, this is an investment of £600 million. Pounds. So it is... You know, absolutely uh, committed. We are absolutely committed to getting uh, next generation super fast broadband to 100% of residential and and business premises. And you know, if you look at the the latest Think Broadband uh, statistics, uh, right now 93.5% uh, of premises already have super fast broadband in Scotland, which is already up from under 60% in 2014. So there's a lot of work and a lot of progress, but that job is not finished until we get to that. 100% target. Uh, First Minister, I think the procurement process was supposed to be completed in February this year. The contracts were then going to be announced later in April. Now we've heard that they might not be announced till after the summer. When they are announced, and if you could let me know when they will be announced, will it include when the delivery time with, of those contracts will be, will be made available to the public? First Minister. Be my expectation, yes. Um, the, this is a complex project and you know, the reason why it is costing £600 million to complete the final bit of the journey, you know, as, as well as I do, the, the geography, the topography of our country, this is very complex. We want to have 
uh, a robust procurement process, so we get maximum value for, for taxpayers' money. That's why we will take the time uh, that needs to be taken to make sure we're getting uh, that robustness. But there is, and, and again, I'm not, you, you sort of, uh, and it's entirely within your, your right to do so, you rule your eyes at me when I, I talked about the reserve devolved split here. This is a commitment that is way beyond any other part of the UK. And when we deliver this, as we will deliver this, Scotland will have uh, super fast broadband access that is way in excess of any other part of the UK. And it is worth uh, making sure, given the importance of it to people in every corner of the country and the scale of investment, that we get it right. I think I only roll my eyes because I, I, don't, I don't think that you're ambition lacks ambition. I totally support what you're trying to do. What I'm trying to do is to understand from the committee's point of view whether it will be delivered on time. Now, I just as a final question, there will be some people in the R100 project who don't get fibre to their house or terrestrial connection to their house. And there is a real concern out there, and we've had no confirmation from the committee, that those people will be given the same offering of broadband by satellite or uh, microwave to their houses that the people on terrestrial lines will be given. Can you give an assurance that those people will not be left behind? Because I think that's really important for the committee to know that and the people to know that. First Minister. Yes, uh, our uh, commitment is 100% uh, superfast access. You're absolutely right for a, a small number, although it doesn't matter how many for those individuals that will be important, that will not necessarily be uh, fibre to uh, the premise. Uh, that's one of the, the things that we are uh, looking at is what the options are. And this is an area, as you know as well as I do, where technology is advancing all the time, what the options are for that small number of people who will uh, require uh, different solutions. But our absolute commitment is 100% super fast, the, you know, 30 megabits per second, which, you know, compared to the commitment, more partial commitment than the rest of the UK, which is 10 megabits per second. This is, and I, you know, I take your, your point and your assurance that you're fully behind the ambition of this, and I, I think that is, is very welcome. Uh, it is complex, it is difficult, uh, but we are absolutely determined to do it, and I'm sure your committee will scrutinise us every step of the way. Price. So the same, the same price. Look, let me, I, I'm, not, I, I'm not trying to dodge a question. We're in the middle of a procurement process right now and you know some of the, the the questions that you're asking me here flow from the conclusion of that procurement process but all of the detail of this will be available for your committee to scrutinize as we go through this process okay. uh, now call james dornan convener of local government and communities to be followed by joanne lament who's been very patient Mr. Dorn, you're very like you, Ms. Lamont. Thank you, <laughs> Deputy President Officer. Good afternoon, First Minister. I wonder if you could give us some information around the timing of the local governance review and also an update on what you're finding are the key challenges emerging from the consultation phase. First Minister. Well, the, the first phase of the engagement um, as part of the review concluded, I think, just before Christmas last year. Um, there were 4,000 people took part in that. Uh, 40 public sector uh, partners also submitted proposals for alternative governance arrangements. Um, there was, uh, if I can uh, s s summarise this, there was uh, a lot of consensus that change and improvement in local government was needed. There was less consensus about exactly what that change should look like, which is why uh, the, the next phase of this is intended to get uh, into some of the detail of, of potential options. Uh, ministers met uh, with the COSLA leadership in February to discuss uh, the ideas that had come forward in the first phase um, and uh, to look at the, the next phase. And uh, the Aileen Campbell, who's the lead cabinet secretary for this, um, will set out with COSLA the next steps for the review process uh, shortly, including the timetable for any legislative action that flows from that. And I know she would uh, be very keen to work with your committee on the, the detail of that too. OK, I appreciate that. But I wonder if you've got any idea of, at this stage, uh, except the second stage is, uh, is forthcoming, but the extent and the range of any anticipated legislation. I mean, for example, are we expecting minimal changes or a more fundamental rethink of uh, local government structure? First Minister. I think it would be premature for me to you know, say at this stage what particular specific changes we would anticipate before the next stage of the engagement um, takes place. Um, you know, there are a range of views that 
that came forward in the, the first phase, but you know, it wasn't the case that there was a, a sort of coalescing around a particular model. It's also really important that this is not something that is decided by the Scottish Government and then you know, done to local government. COSLA and local government are you know, key partners in this and we're taking this forward together. So I think while um, I would like to sit here and say here's the model that will go into legislation and that we'll be talking about, I think it's important to allow that next phase of engagement to take place and for the more concrete proposals to flow from that. I wonder if, uh, what plans the government have in mind to sort of strengthen local democracy and encourage local authorities to engage further with communities about local decision making and how that feeds into what you're expecting to come out of local government. First Minister. Well, a lot of local councils are already, you know, I mean, I know in our, our uh, area in, in Glasgow, you know, the, the work that Glasgow City Council are doing around participatory budgeting, I think is very positive, And I would, you know, encourage them and other councils to continue with that. Uh, obviously, we have uh, a number of proposals uh, in train right now to give councils uh, more powers around uh, certain aspects of revenue raising, uh, some of which are, are controversial. Uh, the work at workplace parking levy, which is obviously very relevant to the climate change discussion we had earlier on, uh, the issues around a, a transient visitor uh, levy as well. So these are not about the Scottish Government telling local government what to do or what not to do. It is about empowering local government to make the decisions that are right for their own areas. And that's something that I think most people in local government would say hasn't happened far or fast enough in recent years. And there's an appetite for that to continue. OK, thanks, First Minister. And I call lastly Joanne Lamont, Convener of Public Petitions. Ms Lamont. Thank you very much. Um, we've had this conversation before, but you'll know that the Petitions Committee deals with a wide variety of, of issues, as wide as you know, people who want to put petitions in. Um, but I think if you were looking at themes, you would say they're very often driven by concerns about a policy by a government or by a, a public body, but as often by a concern about the gap between what government policy or public body policy is supposed to be and the lived reality of people, of individuals, families and communities. And as an example, we're currently dealing with a petition highlighting concerns of the implications um, of the GP settlement for rural and island GP practices. Um, I wonder what uh, equality impact assessment you made on that settlement before it was uh, taken forward. And um, probably most relevantly, what island proofing, rural proofing was done in that policy? First Minister. Um, I, I will write to or ask the Cabinet Secretary to write to the committee if uh, she hasn't already done so on the specifics of, of that in terms of you know, formal uh, equality impact assessment. Of course, that was the GP settlement was a, an agreement we reached with the BMA that went, went uh, out to ballot uh, amongst GPs. One of the central uh, commitments in that was uh, ensuring that no rural GP would lose any income as a result of that. The uh, new contract is uh, very strongly supported by the BMA, um, which represents GPs, although I do, and I'm, I'm not dismissing the concerns that are being expressed by uh, rural GPs, and we will continue to listen and try to address and, and respond uh, to those as, as firmly as possible. And uh, we'll, I, I'm, I'm not sure what stage your petition, that petition is at before your committee, but as we do with all petitions, we'll look carefully at the evidence given and any outcomes of them. Well, I, mean, I, I couldn't overstate the, the importance of this petition to the petitioners and people round about them. They do make a very compelling case. We're, in fact, hearing from the Cabinet Secretary tomorrow, so we'll, we'll afford the opportunity to pursue that further. I wouldn't make the point to you there was only a 39% turnout, and that's 70% of those voted to support the settlement. But that exposes the very issue I'm trying to look at with your own process, because that may look like an endorsement of a policy. But if you were doing an equality impact assessment... If you were looking at it, how it affects individual groups or areas in terms of policy, you might discover something very different. So overall, people are content with it. But within a rural and island community, and I'm talking about all policy, it may actually be very different. So your um, government has committed to island proofing as part of the island's um, agenda. I'm assuming that government is comfortable with expanding that a little to be rural proofing as well. What does that look like? In terms of this, are you saying you don't know whether a rural impact assessment was done on this? And if, if, and if you don't know, should there have one been done? Um, and, and that goes to the heart of 
all policy, which I would assume good policy starts with testing the consequences before you actually move to saying this is what you're going to do? First Minister. So, in, in general terms, I agree with the premise of your question. We One of the things that all governments have to um, consider and, and be open-minded to, and where the Petitions Committee of this Parliament plays a very important role, is that relationship between policy and the policy intentions and the experience on the ground. So I agree with that. In terms of, I've, I've said, I've, I'm not going to sit here and uh, say, ex for reasons I'll come on to in a second, where this is, what we're talking about here is not, is, is slightly different to a, a government consultation on a policy. Um, I will get you the information on the, the assessments that were done. If you just... Settlement. And if a settlement's been offered on your behalf, surely you would I, need, to, you would need to satisfy yourself as government that mm. it's going to have a fair and, and equitable outcome for everyone. As we would, you would even do routinely, I will, I've said I will provide you with the information of exactly what assessments were done on that. Uh, I think that's probably more helpful to you um, than, uh, than anything else I can do uh, right now. But in terms of the, the general point here, uh, this was not a government, it was a a proposal that was negotiated between the government and the BMA. The BMA then put it out to ballot. So in terms of turnout figures and, and such like, that was a, a ballot done by an external uh, professional organisation. It wasn't a government consultation. So uh, you know, I, I can't you know, comment on the arrangements within the BMA for uh, increasing or promoting increased turnout. A more general point would you know, be that if there was an overwhelming opposition to a contract like that, I would have expected to see that more generally uh, come across in, in the ballot. There was a, of those who voted, there was an overwhelming endorsement of that, although we recognise and accept that there are particular concerns being expressed by um, rural GPs. You asked me a question about island proofing and rural proofing. I, again, I'm happy to uh, give more consideration to give you a, a more... Uh, a fuller and more considered answer on this. The, the island proofing obviously comes from the, the Islands Bill that went through uh, Parliament, so there's a statutory underpinning to what we've agreed to do there. Uh, if there is a, a way in which we can broaden that to more rural proofing, I'm very happy that we give that consideration and uh, perhaps draw on some of the uh, experiences and evidence from this petition in making those decisions. I would really seek, I mean, I appreciate you're not going to be over the detail of a particular settlement. The settlement was negotiated on behalf of your government. If we're committed to effective equality impact assessments and effective rural proofing, island proofing, you have to apply it to all policy. And the fact that there's a majority for something doesn't necessarily mean it's not disproportionate of an effect on a particular group whose voice is not so strong. And just to say to you that in, in relation to the, the evidence we've had, it's rural GPs are expressing concern. They're not engaging with the process that was set up. They've resigned from the short life working group. And they also the evidence we've been given is that not just does this settlement cause problems for rural GPs because of the way in which they practice in remote and rural areas where they can't rely on teams coming in, but also money has been taken out of poorer areas within urban settings, going to more prosperous uh, areas, partly because a lot of the money will follow um, older people, and older people are uh, if they live older, they're going to be living in more prosperous areas, certainly in one city. So I'm probably going on slightly too long. What I would really look for an assurance from you is in terms of policy, you start with the quality impact assessments, you start with the island proofing, the rural proofing, on everything. Because otherwise you can't really sign up, or it's difficult to sign up to a commitment around equality if that's not the mindset of those people are doing, who are working on policy on your behalf. First Minister. I'm not disagreeing with that, Thanks. just for... You know, the sake of clarity, I'm, I'm simply saying I will provide you with the, the detail of exactly the, the, the different assessments and, and work that was done around both the proposal that was put by the government and how that developed as a negotiation uh, developed. Um, in terms of the, the GP contract, we will continue to listen to the views of uh, rural GPs through the petition and in other ways that expressed. Um, I would say here, this is not in terms of some of the concerns that you have uh, raised, which went broader than just rural, it's not just the Scottish Government saying that we don't agree with those concerns. The BMA, which represents GPs, say that they don't agree with those concerns and you know, have themselves said that they think, well, I'm sure they would 
you know, want uh, improvements in all sorts of areas, uh, that they think this is a good settlement and a, a good contract. So it's not here uh, simply the, the Scottish Government saying one thing and the profession saying the other. The profession overall uh, supported this contract and the BME uh, have, uh, I think, uh, disagreed with some of the the concerns that have been raised. Make my point but, for me, because historically we know yeah. that organisations representing groups did not themselves necessarily represent right. groups within that. Right. So, can I can I just say the points? I want to I want to be fair to everybody because you've had well over your time, but I'm going to allow other people in now for something. Can you can no, come no, in no, at the fine. end. No, uh, I've got time in hand, so what I want to go is back to everybody around the table. I've got Margaret Mitchell. Does anybody else want to come with a supplementary for the committee? Then Joanne, if you want to come back in, I've got Lewis McDonald. Anybody else? Oh, and Bruce Crawford. Right, so that's for starters. Thank Margaret you, Margaret Mitchell, please. Um, it's often stated as society is judged by its treatment of its most vulnerable members, First Minister. With this in mind, the Justice Committee carried out work on elder abuse. Do you agree, First Minister, there's a potential gap in the legislative framework to tackle this issue? And following on from Jenny Mara's line of questioning, and to give you a specific example, do you consider that the issue of witnesses having difficulty again collecting data from various agencies, including Police Scotland, who told the committee that it was unable to provide any data on the number of offences against the elderly, will require to be addressed? First Minister. Well, we have welcomed uh, the work that your committee has done in this area. Elder abuse, um, as we know, can take many different forms, but it is you know, devastating for uh, the victim when it happens. Um, the criminal law has a role to play in this. This is a very relevant area um, in terms of the review of hate crime legislation that is already underway. We've consulted on a new statutory age aggravation under uh, that consultation, uh, which would mean that any criminal offence that is motivated by hostility towards someone on the basis of their age could be aggravated uh, in court uh, and obviously the, the hate crime bill will come forward uh, shortly. Uh, we're, we've also looked at wider changes to the law such as a, a vulnerability aggravation uh, and a new offence of elder abuse will also be considered so that the, the possibility of a specific offence uh, there may help in terms of holding perpetrators to account. There's also, um, sorry for going on so long, there's also uh, relevance here in terms of the Adult Support Protection uh, Act 2007, uh, which provides a range of uh, protection measures. Uh, so it's not the criminal law uh, there, but protection measures. And we are uh, currently reviewing uh, that legislation alongside mental health and adults with incapacity legislation. So there's a, a lot in here, I think, that the work that your committee has done has helped to shine a light on and will help us to make uh, decisions as we move forward. I think the problem, First Minister, is age isn't a hate crime per se. Is your microphone on? Yeah. Sorry. Uh, there you are, Margaret. Uh, age isn't a hate crime per se. The difficulty ally, uh, seems to come when they're trying to identify the age that elderly abuse could start. So what the committee is looking at, could we treat this the same as we've treated the domestic abuse, coercive and um, controlling behaviour legislation, which is um, gender neutral, but still manages to um, tackle gender issues. Uh, if we had the same principle for um, elderly abuse, you could still have the controlling coercive behaviour um, where ears, uh, age is a factor, but um, doesn't stop um, the legislation going through from a lack of having a definitive um, definition of the age this, this um, would start, this offence would start. First Minister. I, I, I'm happy to consider that it may be that some of this evidence has already been taken account of in the, the hate crime consultation. Um, but if it's not, I'm, I'm happy to look at that. You know, I, I think there would be just responding um, immediately to that, as I'm sure the committee has already uh, said. I'm sure the, I think there'd be a number of complexities in how that would work in practice. But, you know, that's not to say it's not something we should look at doing. So I'm, I don't want to go too much further than that today before having had the opportunity to give it greater consideration. But I'm happy to get the Justice Secretary to uh, look at it and come back to you on it. The committee on this uh, very vexing issue. Thank you. Uh, Louis McDonald to be followed by Bruce Crawford to be followed by Bob Doris.
Thank you very much. Just wanted to come back to some of the funding issues and, and transparency. You talked about brokerage as reflecting government support for uh, health boards and delivering patient care, but clearly it, the, the, it, it raises a question about the transparency of funding across the board. So if you look at brokerage and one-off payments and so on, they do affect the distribution of funding. And I know over the years you've answered many questions on the application of NRAC, the NHS Scotland resource allocation funding formula. Uh, do you think that is still... I mean, one thing everyone, I think, has agreed on in the past is that it was a transparent measure of whether boards were receiving uh, more or less than NRAC suggested that they should. Do you think that it remains transparent in that sense with, with these additional uh, funding streams coming into play? And a particular new aspect of that is uh, that where there is funding to integrate integration authorities, which is a social care element, the local government funding formula in some way is being taken into account, which seems to mix uh, the methods of providing funding uh, in, in that context. I wonder what your thoughts are on that. First Minister, for, firstly, I'd hoped my days of having to give detailed explanations of NRAC were, were behind me, but clearly, clearly not. Um, I think as we change, and, and integration is a perfect example of this, as we change how services are delivered, the, the sort of traditional funding arrangements and, and the transparency and scrutiny around those have to change and, and keep pace with that. And I think that is, in terms of integration, it is work in progress. And I think it's important that we continue to, to make that progress so that there is the same, uh, I think, probably people would say in the past there's not been uh, perfect transparency around health service budgets, but that for integration authorities we have the same transparency as we do for uh, looking at, at health budgets uh, alone. In terms of brokerage, I, I, and you're right to, to some extent, brokerage um, is, is outside of that uh, normal arrangement and that's why I think the new arrangements that Jean Freeman has announced will, will help with that, because it puts that onto a much more formal uh, footing. Um, that said, I, I think um, if a health board was ever to, for whatever reason, because there will be different reasons that arise, uh, that give rise to the need for brokerage, if a health board was ever to find itself in a situation where it, it needed that help and the government was deciding for you know, reasons of NRAC uh, compatibility or whatever not to give it, then I suspect most people across Parliament would be saying, no, actually, you should, because... Uh, so these things will never necessarily be absolutely perfect in how that's you know, what comes from having the kind of relationship between government and health boards that we have in Scotland. But through the different strands of work that we touched on earlier on, the information that's been provided to your committee now, the medium term financial uh, framework and the arrangements around three year budgeting and flexibility for health boards, I think we, we do need to continue to work to make that as transparent and as open to scrutiny as possible. And we'll continue to try to do that. Uh, Bruce Crawford, followed by Bob Doris. Thank you, Deputy President. Uh, First Minister, my committee has also been in undertaking same, some work into earnings and pay policy. And one of the factors that is, is coming through in evidence is that over the last couple of years in particular, earnings growth in Scotland has not kept pace with the rest of the UK. Two main factors, downturn in the oil industry and the London effect um, exacerbating that. Um, but given the link and correlation between earnings and growth and the requirement in the fiscal framework for uh, growth in Scotland and the UK to be at least equal, or, or if we're not, then either we lose out or we gain. I just wonder what you might, the, what the Scottish Government, what more they can do in the area of trying to encourage earnings growth um, as well as general growth in the economy. And with that, and, and if not to make that even more complicated, is there opportunity through the climate change emergency you have declared to look at how we're going about doing our business in the in Scotland to help drive growth levels um, for, for the future and therefore ensure that the Scottish budget is protected under the fiscal framework? First Minister. That's a big question. It well, was, <laughs> I'm sure the First Minister. An important did. question. Um, but if I thought INRAC was difficult to explain, yeah. you've just given me a greater challenge, which is to try and explain the operation of the fiscal framework, which I, I think I will save you from, although you probably can explain it as well as I can. Um, but you're right in terms of the, the factors that drive the fiscal framework and therefore drive the block grant adjustments every year. So we pay very, 
very close attention to all of that data and all of uh, that evidence. Uh, often, and you alluded to this yourself, um, you know, just looking at Scotland versus UK comparisons reveal uh, what is a more complex picture underneath, wh where London and the South East often skews the picture uh, for the, the whole of the UK uh, particularly. Um, in terms of uh, earnings, we, we are seeing lots of much more positive data uh, as we come out of the impact of the, the oil price uh, crash. Um, both in terms of economic growth. This morning we've got very positive uh, data around productivity uh, compared to the UK as well as being positive in its own uh, rights. All of that feeds into uh, the, the, the data on, on earnings. Uh, we obviously also put a lot of emphasis on uh, the living wage campaign to try to use the, the levers at our disposal to lift uh, particularly those on low pay up because that, that helps with that as well. But these are all uh, really... Uh, Earnings levels are important for the impact on individuals and families, obviously, first and foremost, but how all of that plays into the complex, increasingly complex way in which this parliament is funded is, uh, is very important as well. So uh, we'd be very keen to continue uh, to work with your committee to try to both understand those drivers and make sure that we're doing everything we can to try to influence it. Bob Doris, followed by Jenny Mara. Thanks. <coughs> um, first Minister... Uh, the Social Security Committee has just recently finished taking evidence on how the Social Security system, both at a Scottish and UK level, indeed local authorities, can best support uh, those those in housing need. Um, now, we've still to undergo our deliberations in relation to that. One of the interesting things that emerged from that was information in relation to the Homelessness and Rough Sleeping Action Group suggestion that, in terms of um, housing and homelessness and temporary accommodation, that perhaps the money in the system is not used as meaningful as it could be. And if housing benefit monies in that area was put into an overall pot of cash, we could do something really meaningful in relation to that. Now, the committee still took a view on that, but I thought this was an appropriate forum to raise that, given that it's not just a social security committee concern. We've got Bruce Crawford here as a finance committee concern about the, the prudent use of public funds. We've got the local government committee convener here. There's key issues there. We've got the health committee convener here, uh, uh, you know, and we've also got the education committee convener here, and you look at the outcomes across all those indicators, and there's really a need for both cross-party and cross-committee working if we're to really reform that area. And my interest, of course, is the best use of social security monies to protect vulnerable people and get better outcomes. So I suppose that I'm looking for any information the First Minister can give in relation to that, but more importantly, um, a commitment that you'll seek to work cross-party and cross committee in relation to whether that is the devolution of those housing benefit monies or it's an agreement with the UK government in terms of how those monies can be used more imaginatively to support people in need. First Minister. Well, we'll provide whatever information we can to help inform uh, your deliberations on that uh, if you want to uh, you know, tell us what would be, be helpful. Um, in terms of the, the devolution or agreement, you know, I would prefer the devolution. I think it is much. Uh, easier to be innovative and flexible around that if you actually have control but you know we would also look to see if we could reach a, an agreement if we uh, thought that was uh, necessary more generally i mean i i'm absolutely certain that how all of the, the the totality of the public resource supporting homelessness or supporting people in housing right now could be used better if it was used more coherently um the work that the uh, Homelessness and Rough Sleeping uh, Task Force did, I think, is you know <coughs> hugely important in terms of trying to drive some of our policy change. <coughs> Excuse me, some of the work we're doing now around Housing First, for example. But as with any area of policy, <coughs> the more preventative you can make the spend, the more impact it will have. And I think a lot, particularly around homelessness. Uh, won't be unique here, but certainly it will be the case here. Too much of the money is spent reactively rather than proactively and preventatively. And I think you make the point that that's not something that any one government department or perhaps given our current constitutional arrangements, even any one government can solve on its own. We need to look at it across the, the piece. And we certainly are very keen following on from the uh, task force's work to continue to do that. Jenny Mara. <laughs> Thank you, Deputy President Officer. First Minister, um, another issue um, that cuts across 
the whole public sector that the audit committee is very concerned about is severance pay. And we've had um, issues recently in the Scottish Police Authority with um, huge golden handshakes um, and also on NHS boards um, with big payouts. And these payouts are often to reward failure, but that failure is rewarded at the taxpayer's expense. Now, Derek Mackay has promised uh, the audit committee Scottish Government policy on severance pay in the public sector, and we patiently await that. But I was really looking to get from you, First Minister, what principles you would like to see underpin such a new policy at government level. Will you be looking for a cap on severance pay, and do you think it's acceptable that taxpayers' money is spent on these huge golden handshakes that are often to reward failure? First Minister. Well, I would uh, encourage you just to be a little bit more patient on the, the policy. Uh, I, th I think decisions are in a, a final uh, phase of that, so hopefully that will be shared with your committee soon. And some of the, the detail of the questions you're asking me around caps and such like will be uh, answered and addressed in that. In terms of principles, um, failure shouldn't be rewarded, um, and that should be a key guiding principle. There will be different circumstances and different types of severance payment often, or sometimes, I should, perhaps often is not the right word to use there. Sometimes there will be um, a judgment made that it is better for the public purse to settle a dispute with a, a member of staff rather than to go through a process that may end up costing the public purse a lot more. And these will be difficult and often sensitive judgments, uh, but you know it's important that they are able to be taken. But as a general principle, we should not be rewarding failure. Uh, we shouldn't be uh, giving people the ability to walk out of one public sector job with you know, massive payments and you know, walk back into another one uh, shortly afterwards. So these are all the kind of issues that I know are of huge uh, interest, not just to your committee, but to taxpayers generally, and, and issues that are uh, relevant to the, the, the work on the policy that Derek Mackay is doing. Well, that, that just just about time with your cough. You could go over that. It's been a long session here, and I thank you, First Minister, for that. Um, do you wish to make any closing remarks to the conveners? Well, I'm ahead. <laughs> Oh, is that no, the, that was your closing no, remark? No, sorry, I should have said thank you very much for <laughs> all yeah. of your questions. And uh, where I have uh, given a commitment to provide follow-up information, we will do that directly. Yeah. With I don't the think you want the quote concerned. to be a quick while I'm ahead. Um, I just want a bad quote <laughs> to end on. <laughs> can I thank uh, all the conveners? I think uh, I found this session very interesting. I think the format is better, but we can talk about that later. And remind you, we've agreed uh, to, to have biannual meetings with the First Minister. So the next one will be in October. And I close this meeting and thank you all. Thank you.